করে দিচ্ছে স্যার দেখতে পাচ্ছি দেখতে পাচ্ছি
could we start right now yeah yes sir yes sir okay 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 So heartiest welcome to all in this auspicious evening of 28th of February 2022. Before coming forth of today's seminar, I would like to mention a very heartbreaking news of the sad demise of our respected and beloved sir, Dr. Mohitush Bandhapadhyay of Department of Zoology, the University of Bardwan, and happens to be a life member in ZAB from its initial work. We offer our sincere condolence to uh, to his family now we will convey our deep regards to his departed soul by observance of silence for one minute Okay, thanks. Now, we believe that Dr. Mohitush Bandhapadhyay, being a very vibrant academic person, could never support to postpone an academic program of today's. Therefore, we are going to conduct the scheduled program and feel that it will be an honor as well as ideal way of gratifying his disembodied soul. Now, this is the very day in the history of world science since world famous Indian physicist Professor C. V. Raman has propounded his findings on this day in the year 1928, which has become famous later as Raman effect. And Professor Raman won the Nobel Prize first time as an Indian in the year 1930 for his contribution to the world science. In the year 1986, the National Council for Science and Technology Communication, Government of India, announced this 28th of February as National Science Day. The first National Science Day was uh, celebrated on 28th February 1987. Since then, every year, the National Science Day has been celebrating with a separate theme for each year. The theme of National Science Day 2022 is integrated approach in science and technology for a sustainable future. Now I request Professor Shubhjit Roy, retired professor of the Department of Zoology and our guru as well as president of ZAB to deliver the inaugural speech. Please sir. Dear friends, because starting my deliberation I myself also express my deep respect to the departed soul, Dr. Mohitesh Banerji, or our favorite Mohitesh Da, who himself, as already has been mentioned by Dr. Madhavesh Mojumdar, who, who himself was in favor of maintaining the normal schedule and did not like to make any abrupt change, maybe uh, in taking classes or uh, conducting examination. Or any cultural or scientific program. On <laughs> accordingly, we have decided to maintain the schedule. Well, uh, friends, as already been mentioned by uh, Dr. Mojumdar, the 28th February is being observed as National Science Day since 1987, and this is being observed uh, or rather observed to uh, mark. Or to commemorate the sensational dis uh, discovery of uh, Raman effect by the uh, famous physicist Sir Chandrasekhar Venkat Raman, who was awarded Nobel Prize 
in 1930. Uh, all, all of you know that whenever we are going to organize any national program, it is most likely that it will be projected through a theme or specific objective. Uh, why? Because this specific objective or theme is supposed to address any problem that may come to uh, face, that may come in our society, creating definitely certain problems. Well, this year, as it has been mentioned by my well aware student, Dr. Mojumdar, that the uh, theme is uh, integrated approach of science and technology for future sustainable development. Well, it means that we are supposed to design our plan of activity in such a way that in future we will be able to maintain the level of activity without being disturbed by any force or any factor. Well, this can only be possible if we make an integrated approach of different disciplines of science. And it is most likely that any problem which is to be dealt with by science, it has been seen that with that multifaceted or rather integrated or concerted effort is more effective in keeping down the problem rather than unitary approach. And the glaring example of uh, such fact, uh, fact is the uh, fight against uh, COVID-19 in which scientists from different disciplines or rather different disciplines of science, scientists from different disciplines like say virology, microbiology, molecular biology, genetics, health and medical sciences and statistics all this came together to face this problem, menacing problem. Well, unfortunately, I have observed that whenever any development is to be considered uh, by the scientists, they should give proper emphasis on both basic science as well as applied science. But unfortunately, this from this year, the government of India is not giving proper emphasis on uh, basic science, rather uh, they are giving emphasis on applied science. But this is this should not be. Uh, this is an unfortunate matter. Well, uh, we can uh, we actually know that the scientists in general can uh, expect or can apprehend or can assume or predict any change which is going to be held and may, which may create some problem in society. And in that case, the scientists of different discipline will definitely uh, exert some impact or conjoint effort or so integrated effort to control such problems and to develop a sustainable society. Well, in my personal opinion, it may be mentioned that the proposed scheme of this year, that is uh, 2022, proposed scheme can be successfully or effectively implemented, provided as uh, such steps are being taken. Uh, there's number one, that by making the people, people in general, by making the people in general to, uh, know, uh, to know the multifaceted importance of science, to control uh, or to maintain the uh, wildlife, uh, to control the de wanton destruction of the environment, uh, the, which actually affect the destruction of wildlife as well as the destruction of biodiversity. Secondly, uh, by uh, driving away the superstitious thought or ideas that may come in our way and can hinder or hamper the development of society. And thirdly, it, uh, it is suggested that a, blow, a voice a, a protesting voice should be raised by people in general uh, against the uh, superpowers who often make maximum use of uh, uh, national uh, natural resources or exploit natural 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 resources to the fullest extent, and thereby creating some pol pollution, and which is uh, which is nothing but lead lead us to the crisis of existence. And uh, next, we should try to protest against the activities of 
such scientists or natural national leaders who uh, actually uh, disturb the society and for their comfort and lastly i like to mention that an integrated uh, or concerted effort of the effort of by the scientists would be made to fight against any problem of meeting our society well if these steps are properly being taken by the people in general or state leaders and politicians and the scientists in particular we will see that all the problems will be uh, driven and our society will face a golden era of the earth the sooner it is the better it will be thank you thanks a lot sir for your valuable speech now it is the time to start the technical session and i request professor nilandri hajda professor of zoology university of barwan to formally introduce professor achintu kumar pal who happens to be the first speaker of today professor hajda please thank you dr manavesh mojumdar good evening everyone it's my pleasure to introduce today's one of the speakers professor achintu kumar pal before audience professor pal is presently posted at post graduate department acharyo bojendranath sil college kuch bihar he served different colleges under west bengal education service for the last 22 years before joining in west bengal education service he taught in the department of industrial fish and fisheries of bardon raj college and asudos college also he is a naturalist he has a keen interest in wildlife photography and orchid gardening so far he has published 12 papers in international in national journals and four international journals four in international journals his topic of seminar presentation is wildlife conservation why what where and how with these few words i may request professor pal to deliver his speech thanking you all thanks uh, professor hajra i think uh, you can hear me loud and clear like the others yes 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 thank you thank you uh, today uh, welcome sir uh, thank you sir uh, amar teacher rao ekhane achen আমি ভীষণভাবে প্রিভিলেজড যে আমাকে এই একটা অপরচুনিটি দেওয়া হয়েছে এখানে বলার জন্য আমি সবাইকে আমার শুভেচ্ছা জানাচ্ছি বড়দের আমি আমার প্রণাম জানাই আর এস্টিমড কলিগস যারা রয়েছেন তাদের প্রত্যেককে আমি আমার ডিউ রিগার্ডস জানাচ্ছি টুডে বা আই লাইক টু শেয়ার মাই এক্সপিরিয়েন্স ইটস নট এ ক্লাস জাস্ট শেয়ার মাই এক্সপিরিয়েন্স অ্যাবাউট ওয়াইল্ড লাইফ কনজারভেশন অ্যান্ড হোয়াট আই গট in my experience about this topic that i will discuss about so let us start uh, i shall start with few words from paul oxton uh, he founded one actually uh, ngo wild heart wildlife found uh, it's in south africa and he actually mentioned he actually uh, rather alarmed us that we should now be active for wildlife conservation because uh, by expending money and even money in our research field also we cannot uh, get back the wildlife which we are going to distract or we are distracting each and every day uh, actually Uh, wildlife we we are using the wildlife resources from the very beginning of our uh, rather society or we can say uh, probably from the dawn of evolution of our species as we have learned the use of tools but uh, is it a reality that even at this space age with the digital virtual reality we need the wildlife i am presenting here one uh, uh, chart that is actually indicating the total contribution of travel and tourism to the gdp worldwide and this is from 2011 to 
as you can see there was a gradual increase in the contribution of travel and uh, i mean contribution of travel and tourism to the gdp but in the year 2020 it has come down almost to the half so from us 10000 billion dollars it has come to almost 5000 billion dollars but why i am projecting this chart does it have any correlation with the main topic wildlife tourism well according to the uh, world travel and tourism council the viewing and experiencing of animals that is we call the uh, ecotourism or wildlife tourism it accounts 4.4% of all direct tourism contributions to gdp you know there there are different kinds of tourism uh, but this tourism the ecotourism is the main part or main contribution it it gives the main contribution to the gdp especially for the southeast uh, uh, i mean the pacific countries and the uh, african countries now as you can see it provides almost 9.1 million jobs worldwide now due to the covid pandemic in the 2020 as i have shown you in the previous chart there is a, a gradual decrease there is a decrease of almost 7% to the funding of wildlife conservation uh, it may be uh, very interesting to know that about 90% of all museums worldwide they have been closed and maybe 13% of those museums will never open again so you see for the country uh, just a minute for the uh, development of a country the gdp is the indicative indicators now if we can't conserve wildlife even at this space age even at this uh, digital age we will lose our progress to the future now i am showing this uh, short video as a prelude uh, for a sets of photographs i will show you and these are actually sharing my experience for the wild life uh, you please hear carefully the background noises or the background sounds uh, which are actually indicative of alarm calls when the big cats move through the forest well i think uh, i i am sure that you have heard the alarm calls from the uh, floor of the jungle from the deers or from the canopy uh, by the monkeys whenever a big cat moves through the jungle these alarm calls sound and uh, those who likes to visit the wildlife uh, we actually spot those sounds and we can spot the big cat ultimately uh, the, the this is choti tara uh, i actually spotted her in tadoba maharashtra uh, during april around uh, morning 8:30 am uh, she was collared and she has actually at that time when i visited uh, tadoba uh, three songs and uh, she is not the main actor of the story which i am going to tell you uh, sharing my experience about the wild life this is actually the uh, hero of my story this is one of the songs of choti tara uh, we spotted him on the other side where we were actually residing on the car he was coming out of the uh, this bamboo uh, jungle and he simply ignored us and passed by us as you can see though i have a, a zoom lens but uh, he was very close to us uh, maybe around 10 to 12 feet and he just neglected us and he passed by us 
then when i am i was uh, sure that i will stop pressing my camera shutter as he was uh, going through the jungle and i will lose him because of this big trees then suddenly uh, he did something which you can yourself understand by the series of pictures i am showing you this is a very common feline behavior you can see he has stretched at its uh, maximum to scratch the bust of the tree to mark it and to show it show uh, his largeness of his body uh, this is a kind of advertisement and uh, you can say uh, they are uh, to maintain their uh, home range the felines do uh, behave like that and ultimately he came down and he didn't return to uh, his mother rather the jungle was uh, then full full of the alarm calls he actually looked upwards for the noisy monkeys and he approached to them looked very carefully upwards whether he, he can uh, catch one of these noisy monkeys and he waited uh, for a brief time he looked to the cards nearby shooting at him and ultimately he assessed that the condition is not favorable he cannot catch any of them so he again start moving to his mother but to our uh, curiosity whenever he approached his mother the mother was roaring to him, uh, him as if he was scolding him the boy come close to his mother and submitted uh, himself to his mother and ultimately uh, probably uh, something happened within the mother and son and see uh, and that large cat just came behind uh, his mother and sat there but the mother uh, was not satisfied by his scolding and he actu she actually got up and she passed by his son and the son then submitted fully it turned on uh, its back and as mother passed him uh, I, i think you everyone can understand that now that big cat is just a uh, just looking as a toy he followed his mother and ultimately got up and followed the path of ma ma his mom and disappeared in the jungle then the monkeys they become very much uh, engaged with their own odd jobs and je dolopati she atokkhone relaxed hoye gache ektu khani bisram nite thakle now uh, in my words observing wildlife in their habitats it has unparalleled recreational value and aesthetic value to human and we must uh, just uh, preserve it we conserve the forest to give our next generation this opportunity to enjoy the beauty of the jungle or as you can see uh, as you can uh, as you have saw, saw just uh, from the uh, slides the teaching of mother to its offspring it is universal i think this jungle this this picture uh, will be uh, rather very uh, beautiful to us this is a large jungle with enough light in it but uh, 
how a jungle is created and maintained. The jungle is propagated and sustained, obviously, by the pollination and seed dispersal. And in doing so, the insects, birds, small herbivores, they largely act their own role. In turn, they are dependent on the forest. So if the insects, birds, small herbivores, or large, herbiv uh, large herbivores also, if they are not in the jungle, the jungle or the forest cannot be propagated. And on the other hand, if the jungle is not there, those animals are not there. So there is an intricate interdependence between the forest and its uh, residents. This interdependence is irreplaceable. So if we like to conserve the animals, we have to conserve their habitat, the forest also. This is a short film, uh, rather movie. I shoot in at uh, Kewaldo Ghana Bird Sanctuary, Bharatpur. The pelicans are flying away, and there are uh, egrets at the front. And you can see a purple heron here uh, at the cursor. It's coming. Now, Kewaldo Ghana is the uh, heaven for the bird watchers. I spent uh, many a times there, and the guides, you have to take guides there. Uh, you may not also take guides, but it is uh, uh, necessary to take guides for the first time uh, to get the proper in informations that where you can get specific type of birds and where they are flocking together, etc. Uh, I myself uh, visited this jungle uh, lonely without any guide and nobody has asked me why I am here or I didn't feel any kind of harm with all my uh, instruments. It costs lakhs uh, actually and no one actually interrupted me in the way of my shooting or uh, viewing the birds. Rather, the guides, uh, I have not hired them. Seeing me, they told me, well, sir, you go there. You can get it, get this kind of bird there. Or you just wait here a few minutes, you will get this bird after a few minutes. Or you will get a python there at that hole, like this. Now, this is actually I, why I am telling this. Because uh, Whenever we are conserving wildlife in a, in a geographic area, uh, actually, uh, it means the conservation of heritage and traditional culture there. Whenever we visit some jungle, actually, we like to purchase some handworks, uh, handiworks uh, or artisan's work available there, or some, uh, some kind of, uh, you can say, uh, just uh, gift items from there, it helps to build the heritage as well as the culture of that area. So if the forest or the jungle of any area is lost, we lost the heritage and culture of that area also. So this is an indirect uh, aspect of wildlife conservation, which is very much needed uh, uh, nowadays. Oh, this is black buck. I uh, encountered this black buck at Kanha. As you know, antelope Sarvikarpa, uh, the Indian antelope, is endemic only to the Indian subcontinent. It inhibits grassy plains and lightly forested areas with perennial water sources. The black buck is the sole living member of the genus antelope here in India. Now, in the jungle, a lot of animals depend on each other. In Karnha, we have tigers. We have leopards also. The tigers usually prefer the sambars, a large 
uh, a bit large uh, herbivore. But the leopards, they uh, actually prefer small deers like this uh, antelope, uh, deers and antelopes like this antelope also. Now, this uh, dependence between the prey and the predator is the key of the food chain. Now, if any animal is lost forever from this key or from this food chain, ultimately there is a problem. Uh, you, you all know, uh, I don't like to remember all those things, but you know. So there will be uh, a disintegration of the food chain in the forest. And ultimately, we lose the biodiversity. So for protection of endangered species and biodiversity, we ought to protect our wildlife. This is square leaf rhinoceros, commonly known as the white rhino. Uh, in the northern part of Kenya, actually, now there are only two specimens. And they are actually in zoo. From the nature, the white rhino uh, is wiped off. White rhino is not actually white. In German, weight means square. So square-leafed rhinoceros or weight rhinoceros, in the native language, it becomes became white. Now, this Ceratotherium simum, uh, the last male died a few years ago, and the scientists tried their best because they preserved the semen of this white rhino, the male white rhino, and they, and they tried their best for the artificial insemination on the uh, surviving to male rhino, but they failed. So even if we have the scientific uh, development, we get enough help from the science, and we have enough fund to carry on the scientific experiments or uh, advances, we may not be successful to get back one species from this earth, which we have wiped it away. So wildlife conservation is much necessary. Uh, I think this is enough uh, to talk about why we need wildlife conservation. Now, what is wildlife conservation? Conservation means uh, prevent of waste of any resources. And we know wildlife, in, in common words, wildlife means only the uh, large animals and others. No, actually it means all the birds, insects, plants, fungi, microscopic organisms which are uh, integrated in the forest uh, ecosystem. This is wildlife. Now, conservation of all those things together in an integrated way is actually wildlife conservation. Now, let me show one picture. This mighty Indian elephant against the backdrop of beautiful uh, sect of a forest, it gives us the notion of the beauty and beast of the jungle. But if I took away the backdrop, the elephant no more is so mighty as we have seen previously. So wildlife conservation is meaningless without conservation of the natural habitats of the target species. So now, where and how? Actually, wildlife conservation uh, may be practiced both in the native habitat, which we know that it is called in situ or in site, or in some places where there are protection management, that is called the ex situ. The strategies for the in-situs and ex-situs, they differ greatly. But 
in the recent years it has been seen that there must be some integrated approach in between these uh, two managements because ex situ management cannot be successful without in situ management which uh, uh, rather uh, i like to uh, just show you uh, in the following uh, slides in ex situ conservation as i have told you uh, usually the threatened animals and plants they uh, have certain special kind of management and uh, the zoological park uh, or the uh, safari parks those are some ex situ examples of ex situ management as you can see the target species are taken uh, from the natural habitat and placed in special areas and there are so many uh, examples i have uh, written here now ex situ conservation uh, i specifically like to tell something about the uh, captive breeding because you all know about the gene banks germ plasm banks seed banks etc 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 uh, they are uh, all simultaneously practiced by different authorities but the captive breeding this ex situ conservation is very promising especially for uh, countries like india now in india we get three uh, species of uh, crocodiles one one is magar crocodile or crocodilus pelustris and then the gavialis gangeticus or gorial and mars crocodile or crocodilus porosus uh, it has been reported that uh, there were almost seven species of crocodiles in india but now we actually get these three species uh, in india but uh, during uh, prior to 1972 that is before the enactment of wildlife protection act the natural population of these three type of crocodiles were nearing extinction uh, there there is one report that uh, the Uh, porosus and uh, pelustris population it came down almost to 500 or like that but uh, due to the undp fau funded national crocodile breeding project uh, which actually initiated which was initiated 1975 and ex situ conservation uh, by captive breeding uh, collection of eggs from the nature and uh, just uh, Uh, raising the youngs from them and then release them in the natural habitat restored the natural population of all three indian crocodiles now if we just uh, visit orisha vidarkanika region or uh, some parts of the satkoshia we will see all three kinds of crocodiles together this is a very promising uh, result of ex situ conservation Uh, i would like to give another example uh, you just meet yeshi yeshi uh, his mate's name was pabu even in the uh, covid period covid pandemic they are proud that they have got a baby on 22nd july uh, 2021 now they are actually the red panda and uh, there are many uh, other red pandas in the topkedara conservation breeding center at padmajaraidu himalayan zoo darjeeling now as i told you a few minutes ago if we raise the offsprings and raise them to certain age to release them in their natural habitat the ex situ has performed its duty but then we need in situ conservation in that natural habitat otherwise the ex situ cannot be successful result of in situ conservation in situ conservation as we know this is the conservation of the total uh, rather uh, environment as well as the uh, biological diversity in any forest now they have different tires i am not going to uh, just discuss about those things 
uh, national parks, sanctuaries, etc., 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 and they have different kind of authorities and their laws, and it also varies in uh, rather in one uh, nation to other nations. The concepts differ, but in India, I like to show you the progress. In India, actually, we have 104 national parks, 551 wildlife sanctuaries, 131 marine protected areas, 18 biosphere reserves, 88 conservation reserves, and 127 community reserves. The conservation reserves and community reserves, they are recent, uh, not recent actually, but uh, in our India, they are the recent endeavors. And as a result, we could protect 5.06% of the total geographic area of the country. But if we compare this data with the protected area of other countries, will be ashamed of because in other countries it is more than 10 percent and in some cases it is 20 percent also so by this uh, protection we can conserve our uh, wildlife and we are very much uh, rich in our position as you can see there are 17 mega diversity countries and india is one of them and which actually possess 60 to 70 percent of world's biodiversity in india we have 400 species of mammals 1300 species of birds unique animal species like choshinga uh, as you can see it in Assam, in Kajiranga, you can see it. the Barasinga, swamp deer is also the, there. The sloth bear, Himalayan sloth bear, these are unique uh, animals which we, you will never find in other countries. And there are a vast, uh, rich species of 15,000 15, flowering plants and covering nearly 7% of world's total plant species. We can't imagine. And you, uh, you have known about the Brahmo Kamal. If you go uh, certain heights uh, around above 12,000 feet in Himalaya, you will get Brahmo Kamal. Now, all those are in vain. Uh, lastly, highest tiger population. But all those things will have no result until and unless we have our awareness. There are legislations, there are management practices, but without human awareness about the importance of wildlife for the survival of human within the nature, we cannot go forward all those measures will give no result so my request to all of you to try our best to provide the tranquility in the life of our cohabitants in our planet because actually we owe our survival from them I would like to make you remember once again the Paul Oxton's uh, alarm. Money can never back our wildlife. Thanks to everyone. Uh, just I'm ending my uh, lecture here. So heartfelt thanks to Professor Paul for his enchanting yet very informative and significant talk so uh, we will enter into the next talk uh, without uh, interaction now i request dr shamdash bandhupadhyay assistant professor of zoology Bardon raj college to formally introduce 
Today's second speaker, Dr. Orijit Gongopadhyay. Dr. Bandopadhyay, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, Honorable President of Geological Association of Badawan, other members present here, dear companions, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to everyone. We are very pleased to welcome you all in the online celebration of the National Science Day by the Geological Association of Badawan, which has recently been successful to gain attention of the UG students during the ongoing pandemics by organizing month-long talks and various topics of the syllabus. Being encouraged by our recent success, Hi. we have organized... I'm sorry. We have organized one more program to celebrate the National Science Day this evening to commemorate the discovery of the Raman effect, which led to Sir C.B. Raman winning the Nobel Prize. Today, we have Dr. Orijit Gangopadhyay, who has a keen interest in biodiversity and conservation. Dr. Gangopadhyay was born and brought up in the serene environment of Santiniketan, West Bengal, India, the abode of Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore, the first Nobel laureate from Asia. He completed his studies from Vishwabharati University and after receiving PhD degree, he joined Rajiv Gandhi University located in Arunachal Pradesh as a postdoctoral research associate. Subsequently, Dr. Gangopadha joined Department of Geology at Shuram Memorial College, Jhalda in Purulia district as an assistant professor. Out of so many feathers in his cap, Dr. Gangopadha is a recipient of CSR EGC National Eligibility Test in 2013 and has attended and presented in numerous seminars and conferences in both India and abroad. He has more than 20 publications in both national and international peer-reviewed journals and a few book chapters as well. The talent of Dr. Gangopadhyay is not limited to academics only. Incidentally, he is also a very good singer and actor. I feel honored to welcome you all for taking a keen part in this important program. I'm sure that you'll all feel enriched with knowledge after completion of his lecture. I welcome Dr. Gangopadhyay to initiate his lecture and hope that you'll all have a great time at it. Over to Dr. Gangopadhyay, please. Hello. I hope I'm audible perfectly. Yes, yes, you were audible yes, Okay, okay. Uh, yes, my yes. heartiest namaskar to everybody. And uh, I am also really very overwhelmed by this uh, uh, fabulous introduction uh, of me. Uh, thank you, Professor Bondabadhyay, for this. Okay, first of all, just uh, before starting this, I also pay my uh, heartiest condolences to Professor Mohitosh Banerjee. Uh, it's a great loss that uh, he is no more. However, in our Upanishads, it's been said that Sharaiveti, that means whatever we need to do, we need to do it. And as his life, he always wanted that we need to do our works. So this is greatly said already before that uh, we cannot just stop our events and it has to be go on. And uh, next, I would the Zoological Association Bardwan for selecting me and giving me this opportunity to have a chat with you people in this auspicious day of National Science Day. I also pay my respect to my senior colleagues and uh, my contemporary colleagues also, and I pay uh, my best wishes to the students who are present in this seminar. Uh, I'm trying to uh, share my screen. Sorry, it's not visible. I don't know why. Mm. Okay. I hope it's visible full screen. Yes, no, it does. no, no, no. Full screen is not coming. Full screen is not oh, coming. Full screen is not coming. Okay. Uh, maybe some technical difficulties are there. Okay. I, I think you are being able to see at least the slides. 
yeah 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 okay okay thank you thank you so uh, the title of my talk is integrated principles of biodiversity and conservation so uh, first of all i would like uh, to say that um, just like professor ochint kumar pal uh, my esteemed previous spokesperson uh, has already conveyed uh, the uh, entire thing of uh, conservation and wildlife very nicely i am also really very much very much uh, touched by this and uh, this is rather a popular lecture i would like to say that this has been made mainly for the students keeping in mind the students and uh, here i have made this title and here i like to point out these two words one is biodiversity another is conservation so i would first like to discuss about something about biodiversity and then i will have a very small discussion a very general discussion as i don't want it uh, to make it very technical and then i would like to make these two words in a single thread so that we can understand the integrated principles of what is biodiversity and why conservation is needed and how we can do the conservation so first of all we just have a fast look on the biodiversity the basics of biodiversity so we all know that according to the rio convention in 1992 we know the definition of biodiversity it says the variability among living organisms from all sources including inter alia terrestrial marine and other aquatic ecosystems and the e ecological complexes of which they are part so this is one thing and now just have a look on the very basics the types of biodiversity we can divide biodiversity in this three following types that is the first one is the genetic diversity second one is the species diversity and third one is the ecological diversity and we all already know this so just an example whenever we talk about the genetic diversity the human race the entire human race is a very good example for that because whenever we look at human human being entirely we can see that there are very different races we can see the mongoloid we can see the caucasoid we can see the negroid we can see the australoids the australian aborigines we can see many faces we can see many races we can see many skin tones we can see many facial features but deep within we are all one species we are the homo sapiens sapiens but what makes a chinese difference a very different from an african this is for some genetic some genetic makeup that they have within themselves so this is a very good example to understand the genetic diversity that we have so we can say that genetic diversity could be considered within a population how much diverse a uh, particular population is in the form of the genome next comes the community diversity in a community there are different populations and now whenever we are talking about a stream community of australia and another stream community of india so both are the aquatic communities both are the lotic systems however they are different why because they are different due to the different populations the different endemic species that are present within that particular community so this is how we can understand the community diversity also next comes the whole ecosystem diversity we can divide the entire ecosystem diversity into three more groups that are alpha beta and gamma diversity we already know this that alpha diversity is the within community di diversity here in this picture we can see that this is a foothill area and now there are three four communities present there alpha diversity shows a diversity that is within a certain community now beta diversity shows the interaction between the two communities and gamma diversity is the overall diversity of that region next we need to 
talk about the Indian context because we are living in India. So we are not very much interested, although we are very much interested with the entire world. But being Indians, we need to concentrate on our countries first. So I will I would like to first discuss a little bit about the Indian context, the bio biodiversity overall. So it's already known to us that India is a mega diverse country. So in this particular map, we can see the green countries are actually the mega diverse country. Now, what makes a country a mega diverse country? This is very important to know. So to be classified as a mega diversity countries, we need to know about two major points. First point is a country must have some endemic species. Number one point, which is very important. Some species which are only present in this particular country and never present anywhere else in this world. And the second most important point is a mega diverse country should have at least one border that have a marine ecosystem. So if these two points are covered that a country has great amount of uh, biodiversity, especially in the form of endemic species. And another one is if it has a marine ecosystem with any one of its border, then we can consider that a country is a mega di diverse country. Next is the biodiversity hotspots. The red colors are actually pointed the hotspots. And here we can see in India, three hotspots are the most important. So one is the Western Ghats, the Eastern Himalaya and the Indo-Burma region, which is actually mainly the northeast area of our country. Now, this particular figure shows major biogeographical regions of India and their endemic ecosystems, rather, I would like to say, not only animals. So as an example, we can see that these top, these blue colored areas are the trans Himalaya. Next comes the Himalayan region. Next, the yellow part is the semi-arid area. This part... Dr. Gangopadha, yes. Dr. Gangopadha, slides yes. are not moving. Slides are not moving. Is it? Hmm, slides are not moving. I'm so sorry. Just a moment. It, it, it is the initial slides, which is projected oh, still. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. It now, is not now, in now. the slide mode. Mm -hmm. yes. So you have to put... If you uh, go through this mode, you have to put... Uh, uh, Selecting each one at a time. Okay, okay. So I think yes. this is better. So uh, press press a five. Anyhow, it's not getting the full screen. Mm. Now, right it's, now, it is full not... screen. I think okay, it is. It okay. is. It is now full screen. Okay. So biodiversity, the basics. I've. Uh, I'm so sorry that the slides are not moving. Uh, this is, uh, I'm just uh, going very fast, okay? Uh, this was a slide of what is uh, biodiversity especially. This is the types of biodiversity that I have uh, discussed already. This is the human race, uh, the genetic diversity that I have already explained. Next one, I hope now you can see the slides at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, this is uh, the species diversity com of uh, the community diversity that I have discussed. This is the alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. And this is the Indian context that I'm trying to talk about. This is the mega diverse country, the map that I was talking about. Next one is the biodiversity hotspots. And here, the close up of the three biodiversity hotspots. Next. I was talking about this particular figure. Okay, so here we can see that the uh, entire India could be uh, differentiated uh, with uh, these uh, uh, biogeographical regions. And next, uh, we have already mentioned that as India is a mega diverse country, it has a great biodiversity and it contains a huge part of biodiversity in comparison to the world. 
Next comes the endemism. As I was talking about endemism in India, our 12% mammals, nearly 56% mammals, uh, sorry, uh, amphibians, nearly 33% plants, nearly 46% of reptiles, and nearly 4.5% of birds are endemic to our country. This number shows that what a great plethora of endemic species that we contain in our country. Next comes the endemic and endangered species of India. So here are some slides that I wanted to share with you that uh, some beautiful figures, some beautiful pictures that shows the endangered plant species of India. Next, the endangered mammalian species of India and the some representative of the endangered birds and reptile species of India. So seeing these three slides, we can understand that the biodiversity of our country is so very beautiful, but this greatly beautiful biodiversity is undergoing severe threat. And that is mainly because of overpopulation of human. We know we are doing habitat destruction. We are introducing alien invasive species. We are doing many hybridizations that is causing some genetic pollution. We are over exploiting our resources and we are also contributing, highly contributing the climate change. And we are also carrying diseases that are the major threats. But we need to keep in mind that mainly it is the cause of human overpopulation. Next comes the point whether conservation is needed at all. So it is needed at all or not is quite clear from this particular slide, I hope. We can see the mighty animals, one elephant, a rhino, and some big cats. The mighty animals are facing, are actually at this moment on the verge of extinction. Why? Mainly because of our greed. Because sometimes we think that Anything made up of a tusk is actually going to enhance our quality of life. We think that a powder made up of the horns of the rhinoceros is going to change my life. And they have some medicinal values. And we also think we also sell the skin of these big cats with high price, mainly because of greed, because we want to get success very fast. And here, the fourth picture is very important in the context of West Bengal. And we know that this one is the Bengal monitor lizard or the Varanus bengalensis. Now, there is a mythical plant called Hatha Jari. Now, from the term Jari, we can understand that it comes from the term Jari Buti. That is, it is a plant and the root of this plant has such a great power that it can change our luck. It can be used as a penacy and it can just change our life like anything. This is written or this has been told in the folklores. But the problem is that the description of the roots of the plant Hathajari looks very similar to this. And unfortunately, this is not a plant root. This is practically the hemipenis of Bengal monitor lizard. And this thing in the name of Hathajari is being sold in various parts of West Bengal. As I'm coming from the district of Purulia, in the Purulia district also, we have a high, huge problem regarding this. So we are trying to enlighten people so that they can come out of the darkness of uh, their thinking. And we are trying to make people aware that actually the thing that is being sold in the name of Hathajari is not the real thing. Who is doing this kind of business? He is doing wrong. And we are tr trying to convey people that whenever 
you people see this kind of thing this kind of act is going on this kind of thing is being sold in the market you need to contact to the local police station you need to contact with the bio, uh, biodiversity board so that they can take proper steps and here also i would like to request my students my dear students if you go out somewhere if you see something is being sold in the name of hatha jadi kindly write a letter to the west bengal Bi biodiversity board so that they can take some proper steps this is very important in the context of west bengal next this is a very important thing that mangrove destruction and uh, it is also being estimated that uh, maybe after 50 or 100 years we are not sure that a city like kolkata will remain or it will go down into the seas we don't know if the mangrove is being destroyed destroyed in this way so now it is the time that we need to think that are we behaving humanly with our mother earth or we are playing the role of a demon so here comes the importance of conservation so what to do now one thing some protective measures to be taken first is very strong legislations are to be made second and third already mentioned by professor achinto kumar pal that in situ conservation and ex situ conservations are so very important and ex situ conservation is an absolute failure if we are not conserving the habitats of any organism another thing comes that is the recording of the indigenous traditional knowledge that this is very important i have seen in arunachal as i used to uh, do some field works i have seen in uh, arunachal that there are 33 major speech, uh, major uh, tribals and they speak 33 different languages their common language is hindi and assamese but they have their own languages however all these tribals all these groups have at least one plant or an animal that they say that this need to be conserved and now this thinking is coming from thousands of years from generation after generation that they make no harm with this particular plant or this particular animal so this kind of traditional knowledge is also important now the thing is maybe they don't know about the scientific thing that is going on behind all these things of this uh, the concept of conservation but maybe some learned people of their society understood maybe hundreds or thousand years back that conservation is very important and they have inculcated this thought within their community and they are still carrying on these thinking so there are various indigenous traditional knowledges we cannot discard all of them and we need to keep record of these knowledges so that we can utilize it uh, utilize our resources properly next is awareness building now this in this very day we are also using this platform if i am being able to aware mainly the students that this is the case that is going on you also need to aware the people surrounding you then only our science will progress because the practice of science should not be only on the black and white that i am doing some research work i am publishing in some international journal and finished i am getting a job or i am getting uh, a promotion finished it can never be actually the main theme of the national science day is to aware people what is happening in the scientific world how india is progressing and what need to be done for the betterment of the society this is also very much needed this is also very much important for us who are practicing science and next we all know we are all uh, screaming about uh, increasing the green cover of the earth now let's have a look of the efforts that have been taken to conserve the flora and fauna of india the central board of wildlife or cbwl was established in 1952 later 10 hours 10 years later it changed its name to indian board of wildlife or ibwl now 
we all know about the wildlife protection act or wildlife conservation act that was uh, came into being on uh, 1972 and it was actually proposed by ibwl next in 1976 the concept of sites also was uh, proposed by the same ibwl there are other legislations and other drives that also have been conducted by the government of india however i would like to put a little bit of light on these two things the 11th and 12th point the last two points first one the biological diversity act 2002 and the west bengal biological diversity rules 2004 they are very very much related and it's not that i'm going to deal with the entire rules and regulations because this will uh, we don't have much time for that but i will definitely discuss about main articles so in chapter 2 regulation of access to biological diversity the third article says that foreigners nris or a foreign organization cannot undertake a biodiversity related activity in our country without the approval of the central government or the national biodiversity authority so they can do this they can conduct experiments but they will need to join hands with our Indian scientists and Indian institutions. That's very important. Article 4 says that results of biodiversity related research that were obtained from for monetary consideration cannot be transferred. Now, this is also for the foreigners and NRIs and the foreign organizations. And here the transfer of knowledge is very important. It is uh, not that if a person has done a research and he wants to publish a paper or he wants to share his, his views in a workshop or a seminar then this kind of transfer is excluded from this article however if monetary consideration or patenting things are uh, being planned then it is not allowed next comes important point is article 6 that intellectual property rights and here patent comes uh, in a very important part here also for patenting something that is related to our biological resources, we need to get the approval of NBA or the National Biodiversity Authority of India. And when, when is the time? Suppose an Indian scientist also makes a discovery that he had, uh, maybe he had isolated a, a very important compound that has some medicinal value and now he wants to do a patent. When? Now he applies for the patent and when the patent office accepts his application before sealing this into his name at that point of time the scientists need to write to the nba that i have done uh, i have filed this patent and this has been already accepted and now it has not yet been sealed but i want your uh, approval so this is the actual process next comes obtaining biological resources for commercial purpose that i have already discussed but this also so some person who is utilizing the biological resources for his livelihood is prohibited however here the old doctors or i mean the traditional practitioners the tra traditional medicine practitioners are excluded from this particular article because it is their knowledge that they are using this particular resource for thousands of years so they can definitely do it they are helping their people and uh, in return they are getting their livelihood so these people are excluded but rest of all the traditional scientists they are to be obtained this uh, this uh, uh, intimation uh, to the state biodiversity board that I am trying to uh, do something that I want to take take a patent or something like that that I may use it in a commercial purpose. Next comes the chapter four: the functions and powers of the National Biodiversity Authority. So the NBA or the National Biodiversity Authority has major three functions. First is they need to issue a guideline how to access the biological resources they need to advise to the central government regarding conservation of biodiversity and they also need to advise the state governments and they can also 
point a certain area as biodiversity heritage sites as just i'm giving an example that uh, all the water reservoirs of the chotonagpur plateau is considered as a biodiversity heritage site if you go to the website of iucn you will see that this is already denoted as kbas that means the key biodiversity area this has been actually prescribed by the nba so next comes the role of the state biodiversity board nothing the same thing that is conducted by nba in national level is conducted by the state biodiversity board as a representative of nba in the in each state and in west bengal we have the west bengal biodiversity board to do this next is the duties of the central and state governments thing is whenever a biodiversity rich area is being threatened we need to take immediate ameliorative, ameliorative measures and this is to be conducted by the nba and the state government biodiversity board they also need to assess the environmental impact whenever any development related project like bridges like making the highways the roads we need to do the environmental impact assessment next comes the identification of biodiversity heritage sites that we have already mentioned and they should notify it in their state level and the central level official gadgets and also they should frame the rules for management and conservation and also now the rehabilitation of the person suppose uh, there is a dam called nil nirjan very close in uh, the district of birbhum so uh, the entire dam was made within a village it used to be a village that particular place and now it has be become a water reservoir and also a conservation site of uh, birds however as there used to be a village so before making this dam government needed to rehabilitate them so that they are not affected much next comes the central government upon consultation with nba they need to denote various institution as the institution for the repository of the voucher specimens and now this is very important whenever a person is working in the field of taxonomy suppose a person discovers a new species or a new genus now there will be a voucher specimen they need to inform that institute that is denoted as the repository of voucher specimen and they need also to send the voucher specimen there as a deposit so they cannot keep any voucher specimen within them within their labs this is a very important rule it was not uh, that much strict in the previous days but nowadays it is becoming very strict so thus we will be able to play our role as an angel and not as a demon and thus we will be able to make our mother earth happy and thus we will be able to conserve our flora and fauna so with this here i end thank you very much i am stopping the sharing and i am now coming uh, to the end of my lecture i at the last i thank again uh, to the entire body of the zoological association of bardwan for considering uh, me to deliver this talk in this auspicious day thanks a lot thank you very much thanks and congratulations dr gangopadhyay for your very informative lucid you, yet bewitching lecture and i am very sorry for this no. connectivity issue no, due no, to no this problem. technical issues uh, in the in initial i was mm. not being able to show you the full slide okay fine thanks a lot thanks a lot now both the lectures are open for interaction though we are uh, running short of time still the lectures are open for interactions if there are any question from the student front or from any other front you may ask both the speakers any question from anyone Hey, Rajinto. Yes, sir. Tell me. 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 Yes, sir. Tell me.
I am rather interested to know that wildlife tourism should be appreciated or do we will exert some control over it to save our wildlife? Sir, uh, wildlife tourism or ecotourism nowadays, mm. uh, it has, uh, uh, you can say, uh, uh, it has two folds actually, two, two different directions. In one direction, uh, there is a management problem with the visitors who don't actually love the forest. Rather, they go in the forest for their enjoyment. And there are also other uh, persons like us uh, who actually finds the peace in going there. Now, uh, tourism is needed in uh, forests because of some uh, revenue ar earning. Right. Yeah. You know, without the revenue, uh, the government cannot run those projects. But uh, uh, as I can say, in Gorumara, uh, at least there are two times they earn much of the revenues. But if you go in Gorumara right now, uh, you will be uh, disappointed because you cannot see the uh, proper uh, wildlife there. There are different uh, views, but in my views, Wildlife is needed, but uh, management should be more strict in regulating the uh, visits as well as the visitors. Thank you, sir. Is there any question from anybody? Shoroj, is there any question in chat box? Shoroj? So, uh, no, since there is no more questions, I'd like to request Dr. Shubhruto Mondol, formal principal of Srigopal Banerjee College and present secretary of SAP, to apprise vote of thanks and to formally conclude the session. Good evening to everyone and all participating in the webinar. We are at the end of the program. But before going into the formal vote of thanks, I convey my deep respect to the memory of Professor Unitos Banerjee, my teacher. Now, I want to thank the Honorable President of the Geological Association of Badwan, who is also the inaugurator of the program, and my teacher also for his continuous support towards organizing the webinar on the occasion of celebration of National Science Day. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Dr. Ochin Topal, that is Ochin Kumar Pal, Associate Professor of Geology, Murindranath Seal College, Kojbihar, and Dr. Arajit Gangopadhyay of the Department of Geology. Achura Memorial College, Jalla, Purulia, for their nice explanation of wildlife conservation, why, what, where, and how, and wildlife conservation and <coughs> integrated principles of biodiversity and conservation, respectively. Both the resource persons give their vital time from busy schedule. I again convey my thanks to them. Further, big thanks. To all the members of the executive committee of Geological Association of Badwan, and also to all the members of the Geological Association of members, that is, live members and general members, for their effort toward today's anchorage. Today's anchoring. I must thank the organizing team of the webinar, consisting of Professor Ovijit Majundar, Professor Niladri Hajra. Dr. Manavesh Majundar, Dr. Saroj Kumar Ghosh, and Dr. Samdas Bandhapadhyay. They provided enormous cooperation to keep the webinar a grand success. Thanks are also due to the members who gave technical support for holding the webinar. I would like to mention my uh, uh, mention my thanks to place and media contact. 
I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take on the completion of the webinar. Thank you all. And at this, and with this, uh,